On Gardening by Robert F. Murray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If I have any claim at all to speak on this subject, it is derived less from experience than from observation. What little practical knowledge of gardening I possess was acquired in early youth, under compulsion, and even then it was restricted to the weeding of paths and the watering of plants. Neither of these operations, useful as they both undoubtedly are, can be said to foster a taste for the art or an acquaintance with the science of gardening. They are mechanical and unattractive. Anybody can do them and nobody would do them if he could help it. This is especially true of weeding. To be set to weed a number of grass-grown gravel paths on a Saturday afternoon in July has been the unhappy fate of many a schoolboy from time immemorial, and I believe there are few instances on record in which the schoolboy has not either openly or secretly rebelled. Many causes urge him to do so, the sun dries up the marrow in his bones the wind is so still as to induce the belief that it will never blow again his back aches his knees are cramped his eyes are dazzled by the yellow glare of the gravel nor is this all the minute green pests are so wonderfully productive that they seem to increase and multiply before his eyes and paradox as it may appear the more he pulls up the more there are left he is quick to notice this discouraging circumstance and the discovery too often leads him to the adoption of certain devices not over honest for instance he will gather from the surface of the path quantities of loose gravel which he will dispose in so judicious a manner as to conceal many growing weeds from the stern eye of the inspecting parent or he will content himself with nipping off the heads of the weeds while he leaves their roots intact in the ground there to bring forth and bud anew before many days by such unsatisfactory methods he strives after economy of labour and indeed he does accomplish one weeding with almost startling celerity but then how short is the period that intervenes before he must undertake another it will be seen that weeding is the parent of sin as well as of sorrow and it is therefore except on the score of absolute necessity entirely to be deprecated the watering of plants is an innocent recreation compared to it generally speaking plants are watered in the cool of the morning or evening and the operator is not compelled to suffer intolerable heat in addition to performing distasteful toil even watering however has many drawbacks carrying a heavy can to and fro and holding it a long time suspended over the beds is apt to tire the arm then the watering can may leak as a rule it does before long the young aquarius finds one leg of his trousers growing soppy and one foot getting clammy and cold ought we to be surprised if in proportion as his temperature falls his temper rises besides he would much rather be playing marbles i have been betrayed into too long a digression upon the sorrows of the youthful apprentice to gardening amateur he cannot with propriety be called for it is years before he can even look at a garden without a pang of remembered pain such at least was the case with me i vowed that if i ever came to own a plot of ground i would turn it into a shrubbery and let it run wild nature i argued is better than art and at all events an art achieved at the expense of so much misery is not worth practising but from the time when i outgrew this morbid feeling i have always admired and envied all gardeners from adam downward and more especially adam for there were no weeds in the garden of eden yet even since the fall the gardener himself has been free from the ignoble toil of weeding which is always left to boys and is perhaps 
a judgment upon them for their original sin the gardener is busied in grander operations he delves he hoes he plants he sows and above all he plans his is no mere handicraft he works with his hands it is true but he is also for ever working with his head arrangement and order do not cease to shape themselves within his busy brain if you told him so the chances are ten to one that he would scratch his head and deny it not knowing what you meant it is true nevertheless and members of the craft have not been wanting who were fully alive to its truth and importance there still flourishes somewhere in the west of england an old man with curved legs and sandy whiskers who is accustomed to work by the day in the gardens of those who can afford to hire him sometimes he will be employed by the week together in one garden on one such occasion his temporary master observed that joe never came to his work until the morning was well advanced so on the third or fourth day he waited in the garden and by and by joe came sauntering leisurely in good morning joe manin sir nice manin smanin it seems to me you always come rather late to work joe yes sir was the ready answer but i'd a lying bed and plannie for ee in this way he considered that he was fulfilling his engagement and so perhaps he was yet it must be admitted that it requires faith more than a grain of mustard seed to enable one to pay cheerfully for such invisible service the invisible service of a hireling being always more or less doubtful but with your true gardener who is not paid by the day but whose labour pays him after many days there can be no question of the planning he is a skilled general and disposes his forces in the best methods at his command methods gathered from the traditions of his predecessors the experience of himself and his contemporaries and his own anxious thought he has nothing to gain by pretending to plan he has everything to lose by not planning nor is his interest in his work of a merely utilitarian kind he is in a certain sense an artist and like other artists he takes pride and pleasure in his work for its own sake he has the same delight in good workmanship the same or a similar love of broad conception like the painter he plans with his brain and executes with his hand his work like the painter's is his own bringing him pleasure as well as profit he looks round his garden and says to himself all this is mine the labour is mine and the fruit of it is mine with what honest self-gratulation he gazes on the trimly pruned trees on the well-ordered beds how great is his satisfaction in a fine potato crop or a splendid yield of parsnips he is bound to acknowledge that sun and rain have done their part in producing the good results but then on the other hand sun and rain have done just as much for williams's garden and his potatoes are not worth the trouble of digging of course it is not to be supposed that a gardener's lot is one of uninterrupted pleasure or undisturbed peace lord tennyson has told us that the very source and fount of day is dashed with wandering aisles of night and so even a gardener's life has its annoyances and difficulties his crops will occasionally fail in spite of wise planning and careful labour the slugs will eat his strawberries the green fly will make havoc among his rose trees the wire worm and the frost are his sworn foes he has many things against him but then what a glorious constitution he has with which to withstand and overcome them he has no dyspepsia to darken his spirit or enfeeble his will all day he breathes pure air and smells fresh healthy scents all night he sleeps the sleep of the just unbroken by evil dreams he is early to bed and early to rise 
and he is consequently healthy wealthy and wise his troubles are not engendered within but come to him from without there are no traitors in his camp to fear but only open foes in the field to face and fight strong in himself he need not fear what they can do to him it is an ideal life the gardener's and a noble profession you cannot call it a trade the trading element only comes in when he parts with his produce to the greengrocer who keeps a fusty little shop in a back street the gardener is no more of a tradesman than the artist the one sells his pictures to a dealer who makes his living by selling them again at a higher price the other does the same with his potatoes the picture dealer and the greengrocer are tradesmen but the gardener and the artist are professional men thus far i have looked at gardening only in the light of a profession but for the amateur there is no finer hobby antiquarian research is not to be compared with it scientific dabbling is barren beside it and if politics be laid in the balance they are altogether lighter than vanity who has not known and envied the country clergyman with a passion for gardening it is such a peaceful passion not a fierce and intermittent flame but a steady glow imparting light and warmth to life the clergyman's pleasure in his garden is of course unalloyed by the pecuniary cares which must beset the professional gardener while his pride in it is infinitely greater than the others can possibly be is he not pursuing the art for the pure love of it without hope or desire of gain he can sit down to dinner with his guest and when the latter praises the cauliflower or avers that he never tasted finer green peas in his life he can beam with satisfaction and say i grew them he can tell little anecdotes concerning the potatoes on the table he is the biographer of the carrots and when after dinner on a fine evening in early autumn he takes his guest out and shows him over the garden he has no lack of topics for conversation he could talk for a week if the guest should happen also to be a country clergyman an amateur gardener the dialogue is something wonderful to hear they grow more excited over the merits of a favourite plum tree than two cabinet ministers over a dissolution a host exhausts his powers of eloquence in dilating upon the colour size and flavour of his plums the guest is equally fervid in eulogising a tree of his own at home these are very fine he says condescendingly but come over to my place if you want to taste plums and so the two honest old souls go on each praising the other's produce but maintaining the superiority of his own as iron sharpeneth iron so doth a man's fruit make sweeter that of his friend in addition to these dialogical delights the clergyman can take prizes at the local horticultural shows and so gratify the feeling of ambition that lurks in the breast of every man even of the country clergyman best of all his rooms are lighted up and sweetened with flowers whose sweetness and light are doubled by the knowledge that they are to a certain extent his own creations perhaps even more so than his sermons are he is a blessing to others and to himself there is not a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral for which his flowers are not in request the festival he enriches with glowing colour the mourning he beautifies with pure and saintly white for himself he gathers joy and health and heart's ease in his garden by his labour there he lengthens his life and makes it more worth living and when at length his hand forgets to pluck the flowers that have carried hope and inspiration into many a weary sick-room their place is taken in grateful hearts by flowers of remembrance surely not less fragrant end of on gardening by robert f Murray.